Good afternoon, everyone. It's a long day, and uh, uh, everything's been uh, so interesting. Uh, I've learned as much as you guys have to expect. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the normal heart function and then some of the changes that can occur in scleroderma. My, my goal is hopefully to help you learn how the heart normally works so that if ever you need to see a cardiologist uh, because of some symptoms or something, you'll have a little bit of background to have a, a more meaningful discussion uh, with, with the doctor. Um, so I will review the normal heart function. I'll discuss heart problems that can occur in people with scleroderma, and then I'll briefly review some of the cardiac tests that are commonly used to evaluate heart disease so you're more familiar with them. So why do we need a heart? And I think I Googled this and, and a lot of things showed up, and most of them were not in my area of expertise. Uh, Helen Keller said, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. Uh, Deepak Chopra more recently said, the less you open your heart to others, the more your heart suffers. Benjamin Franklin, the heart of a fool is in his mouth, but the mouth of a wise man is in his heart. Theodore Roosevelt, I think there is only one quality worse than hardness of the heart, and that is softness of the head. <laughs> However, I think Margaret Thatcher was the most practical of them all. She said, to wear your heart on your sleeve isn't a very good plan. You should wear it inside, where it functions best. <laughs> So the reason you don't have handouts today is because my wife saw uh, the first version of my talk and said, are you insane? No one in that room is going to know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, uh, so, uh, so in retaliation to her, I've used a series of pictures uh, to explain why we really need a heart. It's so that we can walk, not in the snow unless you're wearing gloves, um, so we can enjoy the flowers. Or just sit down and think for a second. Or perhaps we want to climb mountains in the Inca trails. All of these reasons are why we need a heart. So how do we power our cells to do all this activity? Well, the, uh, the cells need some glucose and oxygen. Uh, and those will be taken up by a cell and converted into ATP, which is the energy of, uh, of any cell, and then as you make this ATP, as you might with coal or whatever, there's going to be byproducts, and these byproducts are carbon dioxide and water. Well, so that means in order for a cell in the body to work, or a muscle to work, you need to somehow get these nutrients, glucose and oxygen, to the cell. The cell has to use it up, spits out the garbage, water and carbon dioxide, and then has to go somewhere to be removed. And the way it, these nutrients and this oxygen gets to a cell is through the circulatory system, through blood flow. The blood will deliver the nutrients, then it'll go to the lungs, where in the lungs, all the garbage, you'll breathe it out. Okay? And in order to imagine the number of cells we have in our, our body, it's, it's a tremendous number. And so you can't just have one blood vessel. Um, what you'll see in the, uh, uh, on the right side there is a picture of the hand, and you can see the, the big blood, bigger blood vessels there, and then you see all the network of tiny, tiny blood vessels. And those are just the ones we can see. There are ones that are even smaller than that, so that every single cell ha is, has access to a tiny uh, little blood vessel. So how do we get all this blood uh, that carries these nutrients to every single cell in the body? How do we then take that the, the blood back, uh, uh, back to the lungs so that you can get rid of the junk. Well, you need a pump, a really powerful pump, and it's situated, it's, that's the heart, and it's situated right in the middle of the chest. And if you look in the middle picture there, you'll see that uh, it's, it's spinning. That heart is protected by your rib cage so that nothing accidentally pushes and, and, and hurts the heart. It's one of the only organs that is, uh, you know, the skull, the heart, these are the two main organs that have so much protection built around them. And then the job of the heart then is to circulate the blood throughout the body. And so on the right there is a picture where you'll see this white come in right there. And you see it goes in through the heart, goes from the heart to the lungs via the pulmonary arteries. And then it comes in the pulmonary arteries, it goes to the lungs and, and collects fresh oxygen. 
and it comes back on the other side of the heart and goes out to the brain. And, and so you can see how uh, the blood is circulating continuously. Now, there are act the heart actually is not just one pump, there's two pumps. Uh, there is a pump to the left, on the left side called the left ventricle. The left ventricle <coughs> job is to pump blood to the rest of the body, to the brain, to the kidneys, to the toes, to the fingers, to the whole rest of the body. There is the right ventricle whose job it is to pump blood just to the lungs. Okay, um, so those two functions are separated. Now, here's some interesting facts about the heart. The heart beats 60 to 100 times a minute normally. That, if you calculate it out, is 30 million times a year. It pumps four to eight liters of blood every single minute, or that's two million liters of blood a year. Imagine how much milk that would be, right? Um, the heart does 25 million joules of work per year. So this, this thing is going all day, all the time. Now, when here's a picture on the right of, of the heart, kind of as we're more used to seeing it. You have the left ventricle down here. You have the right ventricle here. And I'm going to talk about the atria in a second. So the, because the job of the left ventricle is to pump blood to the whole body, imagine the amount of pressure the heart has to generate to get the blood all the way to your toes and to your fingertips. <coughs> and when you measure your blood pressure, right, that's the pressure generated by the heart. It's your, your top number, your systolic blood pressure is usually 90, maybe 140 if it's a little bit high, could be even higher sometimes. Um, and, and that's kind of 90 to 140 for your systolic blood pressure is considered somewhat normal. Um, the right ventricle, on the other job, it has a much easier job to do. All it has to do is pump blood through air-filled, light, air-filled lungs. And so the blood pressure that the right ventricle generates is much, much lower, 15 to 30 millimeters of mercury. Now, if, if you've ever accidentally cut yourself and uh, uh, you, you start bleeding, you know that the blood just slowly oozes out. It's not like it's... Uh, squirting out like crazy, right? It just slowly oozes out a little bit. And so the blood flows in the body, especially as it's coming from a vein, going back to the heart, very slow. And so that's not an efficient way for the heart to work. The heart needs all the blood in the ventricle so that when it's ready to pump, everything goes out. So what it does, what happens is that all the blood that's slowly flowing through your veins goes to a collecting chamber in the heart called the atria the atrium. There's a right atrium for the right side and a left atrium for the left side. And the blood will return to the atria. When there's enough blood there, the atrium will pump, send blood into the ventricle, where the ventricle will say, all right, I'm ready to power that blood wherever it needs to go. And so there's actually four chambers to the heart, two atria, two ventricles, one for the right side, one for the left side. And these pictures here kind of demonstrate, first here is just a picture of all the <coughs> chambers. Then in the middle, you see here's the blood coming in through into the left atrium. And then the left atrium will pump, and it'll send it into the right ventricle, and then from there, or to the left ventricle here, and then it'll go out to the rest of the body. Now, imagine every time the heart pumps, you want blood to go forward, not backwards. And so you have to have some mechanism in place to allow it to go forwards and not backwards. And, and, and that happens because the way we, we manage that is by having heart valves. Okay? There are four heart valves, one in between uh, each of the chambers, okay? one between the atrium and the ventricle, and one in between the ventricle and the artery that goes out to the lungs or to the body. And you can see here, um, uh, you can see here on this I image uh, uh, this, uh, 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 the way the valves look. Um, on, uh, on, I'm not sure where the arrow has disappeared to. Um, anyways, uh, so on the top uh, right over there, you can see uh, the pulmonic valve on the very top, the aortic valve in the middle, and then the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve. So those are the four valves of the heart. Now, all right, so you get the, you, I think you're, 
realize that the, there is a lot of coordination that has to happen. You have to have blood to get to the atrium. From the atrium, it has to get to the ventricle. From the ventricle, it has to go to the arteries, and so forth and so on. This doesn't happen randomly. It turns out there's a conduction system that, that's built in that controls all of this. Um, the, the most important uh, part of the conduction system is the natural pacemaker called the SA node. That's on the top left uh, uh, over there, a uh, big circle in the right atrium there. The SA node is very sensitive to your needs. So if you're sitting there, if you're sleeping, it knows, all right, well, you don't need the heart to do as much because you're sleeping. You don't need as much oxygen and energy to sleep. And so it'll slow down the heart rate, okay? On the other hand, if you're out there uh, walking or, or running or something like that, obviously all those muscles uh, need, need more energy to do their job. So the SA node, the sinoatrial node, the pacemaker knows to go faster. Now, once the SA node triggers, a, a little uh, signal or, or, a, or really some kind of mild electricity goes through the heart and causes all the muscles to squeeze. And then it'll finally go through to the AV node, which is the secondary pacemaker, and that'll then cause the ventricles to squeeze. So everything is coordinated uh, by the conduction system. The SA node, which is the primary pacemaker, and the AV node, which is the secondary pacemaker. Now, imagine all the work the heart does. Well, we just said, in order for a muscle to work, it needs oxygen, it needs glucose. And, and so, believe it or not, the heart, ha even though all the blood of the entire body pumps through, goes through the heart, most of that blood does not actually help the heart itself. There, you have a, the heart has its own special blood supply called the coronary arteries, okay? And uh, that, though only 5% of the blood that goes to the heart actually goes into the coronary arteries to feed oxygen and glucose to the heart muscle, okay? And, and, it, and, um, and you, on the left here, you can see the three main coronary arteries. Um, on the very left is the right coronary artery. That supplies blood to the back of the heart. Across the front there is the left anterior descending artery, or the LAD. That feeds the front of the heart. That's the most important artery. And on the, on the uh, right side there is the circumflex artery, which feeds blood to the uh, side of the heart. Now, if you look at the big image that's got a big A on it all the way on the right there, again, just like you saw in the hand where you had the big blood vessels and then tiny, tiny blood vessels, you can see how many of these micro vessels there are all throughout the heart muscle. There's billions and billions of them. Now, what happens when we exercise? Well, so here on the left, these are echo images or ultrasounds of the heart, okay? Um, so here are a couple of views of the heart in different, uh, from different angles, and you see that the heart is beating, pumping uh, this heart here, okay? Can we see how, how it's going there? And then after this patient went running on a treadmill, part of a stress test, we took more pictures and you can see that the heart is beating quite a bit harder. And so it turns out when you exercise, as you guys know, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure increases, your heart pumps harder, the energy requirements to the heart go up, the oxygen requirements to the heart go up, and the blood flow to the heart muscle increases, believe it or not, five or ten times above normal. And in fact, if you have an elite athlete, that we, that we believe that their blood flow can go up 10, 12, 15 times above normal. Now, how do you do that? How can you possibly increase your blood flow that much? Um, well, it comes back to the microvessel. So here's another picture of the arteries of the heart and all those tiny microvessels. These are just the ones we can see. There are many, many more that we can't even see. Okay? So, it, that's hard to understand. So instead, what I've, we've got here are three cartoons um, to kind of talk about the bigger blood vessels and the smaller blood vessels. So on the top middle there is a normal artery. We see the bigger vessel 
tube called the epicardial coronary artery. Those are the big arteries. And then it splits, it branches into three smaller arteries. Those are the microvessels in this cartoon. And you see these little circles, these little blue circles uh, at the entrance point of each of the microvessels there. Well, those are smooth muscles or special muscle cells that are located there. And what happens is when you exercise, uh, the heart muscle starts to work faster like it's supposed to. And then all of a sudden it says, oh, I'm not getting enough oxygen there. This does not feel right. And it starts to secrete these hormones that are very local there. And those hormones stimulate those little uh, muscles, those little blue or gray, whatever color that, that is, um, uh, to kind of open up and relax so that now you open the door to these microvessels so more blood can flow into those microvessels. All right? And, and, um, and so that's how the heart regulates how much oxygen it gets and how much blood flow it gets. Now, the number one cause of death in the United States and probably the entire world is heart disease, coronary artery disease, frankly. And what that means, and, and in layman's terms, that is the development of a blockage in your main coronary arteries, in, the, in those bigger arteries. And so in the middle, in the middle panel, in the smack in the middle of the whole image there, you see a, 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 there's a little cartoon of a blockage there, right in the middle of the artery. And now if you can imagine, if you have a blockage there, you can't get enough blood through that uh, artery so that it can go to the rest of the heart such that when the heart needs to get more oxygen, um, it won't be able to. Now, you'll see that those little blue circles have disappeared. And that's because what happens is when you have a, let's say you have a 95% blockage in your artery. When you're sitting there, it's, you're not generally having chest pain and you're not having shortness of breath while you're just sitting there. You only have problems when you exert yourself. And the reason is that the body is smart enough to know, you know what, I've got a blockage uh, upstream somewhere, and so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these smooth muscles, make them completely relaxed, so all the time I'm getting as much blood flow to the muscle that I can get, just so that I don't have any problems when I'm sitting here relaxing. Now, in scleroderma, you guys, I think, uh, have heard uh, throughout the, the morning, there is a problem with the microvessels, the tiny, tiny blood vessels, oh. potentially. And so what happens in this situation is if you look on the bottom of these three cartoons there, you'll see those little blue circles have excess through there. So what's happening is that due to a little bit of scar tissue and, and various other forms of damage, these little smooth muscles there don't work properly anymore. And so now, there's no way for the microvasculature to increase or, or allow more blood flow to go there. And then that'll have its consequences. So because coronary disease is the number one cause of, of, heart, of, of death in everyone, not just people with scleroderma, and because uh, microvascular uh, disease is a, a particular problem for <laughs> You, you guys, um, I'm going to focus on, on that. Um, so coronary heart disease is responsible, just some statistics so you know, this is normal, good old-fashioned coronary disease for all of us, uh, is responsible for one out of every six deaths in the United States. About 785,000 Americans will have a new coronary attack uh, every year, and half a million will have a repeat attack every year. <coughs> the cost, just to give some idea, the cost of cardiovascular disease in the United States is $175 billion a year. Wow. Nearly a million people get stents or, or, or have their arteries opened up uh, every single year in the United States. And nearly a half a million people every single year need to get bypass surgery. And just to give you some idea, the, the graph on the top right there shows you that most of the cost is related to all the testing uh, to d make the diagnosis that we do. <coughs> and, and the graph on the bottom shows that we're doing more and more of that testing, presumably because we are living unhealthier lives um, than our, our ancestors did. <coughs> so what does coronary disease look like? And when does it start? What's its natural history? Well, interestingly, it actually starts, believe it or not, by age 10. 
Okay, our, just our diets, the things we feed our kids, and, and uh, they are already getting a little bit of disease. In its earliest stages, we call, what, what, what has happens is the wall of the artery gets a little bit inflamed, okay? And um, that inflammation uh, leads to cholesterol depositing in the wall of the artery. By your third decade of life, so in your 30s and 40s, you probably start to have a full collection. You see here the yellow uh, blob on the right side of the screen. You start to have full-blown large amounts of plaque in the artery and the wall of the artery. Eventually, there's so much plaque that gets into the wall of the artery, the wall can't hold that plaque in the artery, and it kind of ruptures so that that cholesterol deposit gets exposed to the bloodstream. And, and the bloodstream, when, when it's exposed to the bloodstream, um, it'll, one of two things will happen. It'll just heal, which is great. Um, and then you'll have a leftover with a narrowing. Uh, if you look, there's a big tube there, and it gets narrowed up on the right-hand side of the, scan, uh, the image there. So that narrowing is, is, is a representation of that cartoon I showed you earlier. So that's what happens if it heals. If it heals, you end up with a narrowing. Unfortunately, sometimes, and in many people, this is all that happens, is that that cholesterol gets exposed to the blood pool, and the blood pool responds viciously to that, and a clot develops, blocking off 100% the blood flow to, to, in that artery so that no more blood can get through that blockage. And that leads to a heart attack. And on the right here, is a, a picture of the heart and that white scar, uh, the, the, I wish the arrow was looking. Um, is there, do you have, do you have a pointer? I do not. Okay. Um, the, um, on the right image there, there's a little bit of black heart muscle and then a big white stripe going out, out all around the heart there. And, and that's scar tissue developing after a big heart attack. All right, so what are our risk factors for coronary disease? <coughs> Well, number one, there's hereditary. We can't do anything about that. Okay? Second, there's high levels of cholesterol in the blood. Well, there's definitely something we can do about this. We have to eat the opposite diet of what Dr. Brown suggested you do for your uh, acid reflux, unfortunately. So uh, high fiber, low fat, um, uh, the exact opposite. Um, the heart and the stomach, you'll, I guess we'll see. Stomach, I guess, will win because uh, it controls our brain somehow, right? Um, um, Smoking. Smoking is probably the number one bad thing you can do to your heart. Diabetes. If you have diabetes, again, if you're eating too many carbohydrates and too much sugar in your diet, you're going to have more, di more likely to have diabetes, and that leads to problems. So controlling your diabetes, if you have it, is critically important. Obesity. So uh, uh, trying to lose weight uh, and, ha and maintain a healthy weight, that is hugely helpful. Having high blood pressure um, avoid, and treating it, making sure your blood pressure is well treated is very important. And, and why does our blood pressure get high? Well, part of it's hereditary, but a lot of it is salt. So now we know the two S's, salt and sugar, that's what's killing us. So again, the Coke, three cans of Coke, he said. To treat. I was having a heart attack. More, more business for me. Um, you want to avoid a high-fat diet, lack of exercise. This is a major problem, okay? We need to walk, if we can, up to 30 minutes every day. This is critical. That would put just a light walk, not with your dog, because the dog takes too many breaks. You've got to go on a full walk, 30 minutes. And then the last thing, I don't know how we do this, is avoiding too much emotional stress. So get rid of your family and <laughs> live out here in this nice uh, yard. All right, so what are the signs and symptoms of, heart, of coronary artery disease? Well, first of all, here's the hint. Symptoms that happen, anything in this area, uh, when you exert yourself, but then go away when you stop exerting yourself, that could be from your heart. And that could be chest pain, coldness and sweatiness, pain in your neck or your left arm, nausea, sudden onset of symptoms, shortness of breath, um, just feeling more tired than usual. That could be because you're not sleeping as well, but uh, that, that's a heart symptom. Now, women are 
very mysterious when it comes to the heart. Um, their symptoms could be flu-like symptoms. Uh, it could just be feeling of indigestion and heartburn. And, and already you see how this becomes very complicated for you guys, right? Heartburn, all of a sudden I'm saying, is a heart condition potentially. Um, and then just symptoms that last and go on and on for days and days that are weird and unusual for you. So those are, are a kind of, women can present very um, mysteriously when it comes to heart disease. So you have to know kind of what's normal for you and when something different shows up, that, that's when, when you can think about your heart. Now, as you develop a blockage in your arteries, as shown by the series of circles across the bottom of that image. Um, normally, I told you a little while ago, while you're just sitting there, the body has found ways to compensate for this blockage. It's not going to bother you to have even a 95% blockage while you're just sitting there. But the, many, the more and more workload you do, or the more and more exercise you'll do, all of a sudden you'll start to notice problems. So the first thing that will happen as you start to walk just lightly is that there won't be enough blood flow that will be able to get through that blockage to keep your heart happy. And we'll be able to detect that with some testing, and I'll show you that. And then once there's not enough blood flow there, if you keep walking beyond that, the heart will say, uh, will, will start to get very stiff, okay? And it'll get uh, quite annoyed, and, and you may start to feel things like shortness of breath at that time. <clears throat> if you were to keep walking after that happens, what will happen is that some of the heart will say, okay, I don't, I'm not getting enough oxygen here, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to be like a bear, and I'm going to start to hibernate. I'm not going to work even though you want me to work. And, and you'll start to have parts of the heart that will stop moving properly. And then finally, um, if you keep exerting yourself after that happens, um, what you'll start to do is mess up some of the electrical system, the conductions, uh, that, uh, the way the, the, the signal conducts through the heart, That'll start to become abnormal, and we can detect that. And finally, <coughs> at the very end of all of that will be the first time you'll actually develop chest pain. So chest pain is the last thing that happens. It's kind of the tip of the iceberg when it comes to heart disease. So how do we detect coronary artery disease? Well, as I said, exercise unmasks coronary disease. So we can do stress tests. What is a stress test? Well, a stress test is where you either uh, actually exercise by getting on a treadmill or a bicycle, or maybe you give a medication, a stress test drug, to trick the heart into thinking that it's exercising. You get pictures when you're of the heart when you're doing nothing, just resting, and then you get more pictures of the heart when you're exercising. You look to see if a part of the heart stopped working or if blood flow didn't get into a part of the heart muscle. Um, and, 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 and such. And so here, here's a kind of a, an image of a stress echo. Echo is ultrasound of the heart. It's nice. So here this guy's running on a treadmill. Um, and then we've gotten pictures at rest and then again at peak exercise. Okay? Uh, stress echo is nice. The way it works is that you send sound, you have a little probe in your hand. And from that probe, you send sound waves to the heart muscle. And those sound waves, like a bat, bounce back. And then we have a computer that can create an image from that. That's pretty cool. No radiation. That's the big advantage of echo, ultrasound. The pictures <coughs> kind of look like this. So they're not the most clear, but they're not bad. They look like one of those fuzzy TVs, right? Um, the second way that we might do a stress test is a nuclear stress test. Um, so in a nuclear stress test, first you, you get an IV, OK? Uh, uh, put into your arm, and we inject a, radio, a tiny amount of a radioactive isotope uh, into your heart, which flows, go, which goes in your bloodstream, and it goes wherever the blood flow goes. And we just take a picture of the heart and see how much uh, radiation, uh, how much of this isotope or, or tracer has gone to the heart muscle, and we know. Uh, whether all the parts of the heart got the same amount of blood flow or if one part got less than the other part, and we can tell. After we get these initial pictures, you take a, um, a two-hour break uh, while that initial tracer clears out of your system, and then we exercise you or stress you in some way, either with uh, exercise or with a medication, and then we repeat the pictures with another tracer 
and look at the blood flow and see what happened to the blood flow at peak exercise. And we could get these uh, really pretty pictures, as you can see down in the bottom here. And what you'll find is a nice donut here, and then uh, where it's nice and yellow everywhere, that means there's good blood flow everywhere. Or you'll have uh, some areas where, uh, at exercise, you can see on the, above each one of these slices of the heart, there's, it's turned red, so we know that there's less blood flow there. Um, we can do the same sort of thing with MRI. The difference is that MRI, um, uh, 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 the nuclear stress test, the one I just described, does use radiation, and that's uh, uh, a negative about it, but it's very accurate, it's very easy to do, uh, and it's done everywhere, uh, almost in any city, I'm sure, they can do a nuclear stress test. Um, MRI, uh, advantages of MRI is it does not use radiation. Uh, the disadvantage is that you have to go, you need a $3 million machine, um, and uh, you have to go to a specialized center that does them, and you have to go into a tunnel, and it's kind of frightening because you're claustrophobic, uh, uh, people uh, don't like that. Um, and, but you get uh, beautiful pictures. And so here um, is a, a perfusion image, or w what we do is we've given the stress, a, stress tag, tr uh, a stress test drug, um, which simulates exercise. You can't exercise in an MRI machine because what an MRI is is a gigantic magnet stronger than the magnetic field of the Earth. And uh, if you were to put a treadmill in there, it would just get sucked up right into the middle of the magnet. <laughs> and so you can't uh, really exercise uh, in an MRI machine. Um, and, and, and so we have to use medications to induce stress. And so what we then do is in inject a contrast agent, one that you guys heard about from Dr. Swice earlier called gadolinium. And that'll go through the various chambers of the heart as shown here. And then it'll, it'll go into the heart muscle, and the heart muscle will turn bright if there is good blood flow there. But if there's bad blood flow there, it'll stay dark, as shown down here by the arrows. And then we get other pictures of the heart where we look at the beating heart from all different angles um, and see what's working and what's not working. And in this particular example here, this part of the heart, if you look at it, it doesn't really come in like the top of the heart does here. So if you look here, you see how nicely that heart comes in, that part of the heart. But this part here is stunned and hibernating because it's not getting enough oxygen. And then we get these really uh, special types of pictures where we look for scar tissue in the actual heart muscle. And you can only do that with MRI, actually see scar tissue in the heart muscle. Um, finally, Instead of doing a stress test, maybe a whole different way to look for blockages in the arteries of, of the heart is to do a CAT scan or a CT scan. And this is Barb, one of our CT techs. She, she's like magic. She makes every patient so comfortable. Um, uh, and, and this is what a CT machine looks like, a little cheaper than an MRI machine. Um, what you have is an X-ray tube on one side of the machine and then a bunch of detectors on the other side of the machine, and, and someone lies in, in, inside the donut here. And then this machinery here spins, um, and what makes that spin actually, only very specific uh, manufacturers can make this, and these are people who make jet engines. That's how fast this thing is spinning. Um, so Boeing uh, and, and various companies like General Electric, they're the people who make airplane engines, that's who make CT machines as well. And at the end of it all, what you get are beautiful pictures as shown on the right-hand side. So here, you can see an artery of the, on the heart. You see there's a little deposit of calcium there, but it's, not, it's very mild. It's, it's not causing any problems. Here are a couple other pictures of the arteries of the heart. They're all clear. Now here, this is another picture. I, I focused in on this area right here. And if you see, the artery has kind of got a certain thickness to it, and then it narrows slightly here and then it opens back up. And there is a, about a, a, a 50, 60% blockage right here. And the beauty of CT is that you can take the artery, which is long, and you can turn it around and look at it on end. And so here, it's like I've taken a bunch of cuts through the artery there. So you see a nice big artery here, and then it becomes really narrow and almost a pinpoint uh, down here, and then it opens back up. Okay? And so I know for sure this person's got a, a pretty tight blockage in the artery right across the front of the heart. So I'm feeling pretty comfortable that their shortness of breath or chest pain or whatever their symptom is is from this blockage. Now, 
what do you do if you find a blockage or you have a, a stress test that suggests that you might have a blockage? Well, that's where you would go for what we call the heart catheterization or an angiogram. Maybe you've heard of the word angioplasty or stenting. These are all the same thing. This is more of a full-blown procedure. It's a, it, it is an operating room of sorts with big monitors, a big table, a big camera, uh, as shown here. And then what the proceduralists will do is they will have you, you'll be lying on the table, you'll, you'll have uh, sheets over you, you know, covers over you, but you'll be without clothes. And um, they, they put a needle into the artery right here in the leg or sometimes here in, in the wrist. Um, of course, if you, uh, uh, sometimes we don't want to go in the wrist for various reasons. And from this um, uh, artery here in the leg, you'll take a little wire all the way up to the heart, and you'll be guided by x-ray. You don't cut on the chest or anything. And then when you get to the heart, you inject contrast or a coloring agent, and you get images like shown on the right there. And, and you can see the arteries uh, of the heart directly in very high detail. And, and in this particular example, there you see the arteries nice and big, and then it narrows down almost to a thread here, 99% blockage. Um, and if we find something like that, if it's just one blockage, maybe two blockages, we'll go in with a balloon right through the leg and put the balloon in and expand it so that the artery opens up and then we'll put in something called a stent to keep that artery nice and open so that would hopefully help improve the blood flow to your heart muscle so that you can get the relief of your symptoms. Now, that's just regular coronary disease and all of us can be at risk of that. In scleroderma, the microvessels are what are affected. And things like stenting, those won't help because the problem is not in the main arteries. Now, we can detect that with a stress test. So, so here's an MRI image. And again, if you look, um, let me go back. So here, this is, I'll just, this is a, a cross section or a cut right to the center of the heart. This is the blood cavity of the heart. And then this is the muscle all the way around here. And you see that there's a dark ring here, right? So that actually, that dark ring is parts of the heart muscle that's not getting enough blood flow because of all the microvascular disease that's there. Um, when you don't get enough blood flow to the heart muscle, what will happen, as I suggested earlier, is the heart will get stiff. Um, and and blood flow, not getting enough blood flow will also cause small, small amounts of scar tissue to start to develop, which will exacerbate the stiffness of the heart. And we can detect that by using echo or ultrasound, where we look, measure how fast the blood is flowing through the different chambers of the heart, and we can see whether it's relaxing properly or not. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and you can do that with just a simple ultrasound, and that's why I'm sure many of you have had an ultrasound or an echo of your heart is to look for this. Now, as the, the pressure inside the heart goes up, as you have microvascular dysfunction, you will probably start feeling symptoms like shortness of breath, maybe even chest discomfort, um, uh, decrease in your ability to exercise, um, these are all things uh, that, that can happen with when the heart uh, is not getting enough blood flow and starts to get stiff. Um, now, imagine um, you're driving down uh, the highway and there is an accident way over there. The problem, of course, the primary problem is way down there where the accident is, but traffic really backs up, right? It goes way back. Well, the same thing happens in the heart. So if we remember, the heart is part of the circulatory system. The blood flows in a specific direction. So it comes from the veins. It goes into the right side of the heart. Uh, and then it goes to the lungs. And from the lungs, it comes back to the left side of the heart. And then it goes out to the body. Well, if you have a problem in your left ventricle, right, where the ventricle can't relax properly, the pressure inside the left ventricle goes up. And that will back up that pressure then will back up into the left atrium, and it might even back up into the arteries of the lung and into the, all the way to the right side of the heart, depending on how bad the uh, problem in the left ventricle is. If it backs up so much into the, uh, that the pressures inside the arteries in the lung get elevated, that's called pulmonary hypertension. 
So hypertension, right, you guys know is high blood pressure in the arm and the body. Well, pulmonary hypertension is when the blood pressure in the arteries to the lungs becomes too high. You remember I said normally it's only 25 or so, the blood pressure in the lungs, whereas in the arms it might be 100, 120, so a big difference. Um, and and so, so you can get pulmonary hypertension. Now, what happens with pulmonary hypertension is that... Um, that's eventually, if it gets really bad, will start to affect uh, the ability of the right side of the heart to pump properly. So here on the top is a normal heart. Uh, the left ventricle beating really well, the right ventricle beating well. What happens with pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle, which is a lazy ventricle, it's used to pumping against uh, the lungs, the air-filled lungs. It doesn't have to work very hard. Well, if you make the pulmonary artery pressures high, the right ventricle is like, whoa, what happened? And so here you can see how it's blown up. Uh, it's just not working very well. It's even pushing this, uh, the septum all the way into the left ventricle. It's really uh, uh, struggling very hard there. And, and if it struggles for too long, you start to develop scar tissue. So what are the symptoms of pulmonary hypertension? <laughs> you can get uh, bluish lips or skin, uh, chest pain, palpitations or a fluttering sensation in the chest, shortness of breath, fatigue, weakness, tired, lightheadedness, a lot of coughing, bloating in the abdomen or the belly, uh, a lot of weight gain because that causes fluid retention, swollen ankles and legs. So these are all symptoms that you should think about. If you've seen those things, then you should think about pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, those sorts of things. Now, there are a number of other cardiac problems that you can have with scleroderma. Um, I've really focused on what I feel are the most common. Um, you can have heart rhythm problems. I told you about the conduction system. You can have problems when your heart goes too fast. It goes too fast, you feel palpitations. You might faint or get really dizzy. It could go too slow, in which case uh, you could get really tired or you could faint again because the heart's not going fast enough. You can get scarring uh, on the lining of the heart called the pericardium, and Dr. Swiss uh, uh, alluded to that, and you can, uh, get, it gets a collection of fluid around the heart, and you need to get treatment for that. You can get inflammation or in the heart muscle itself, and again, that requires special treatments. Um, or you can have problems with your heart valves, and, and there are you know, particular things we'd want to do. So I want to close by saying, Education is the most powerful weapon which you can uh, use to change the world. I did not come up with that quote. Uh, Nelson Mandela did. Um, and so I hope uh, I've uh, provided you uh, some information with about how the heart works and what might go wrong in everyone and in specifically you guys. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you.